The statistics are 10.8% of women at any given time are affected by depression. There's so much shame, Judy. It's very shameful. To, it's actually like the D word, you know? I battle depression because it's, I'm not a sufferer. I'm not a victim. I battle it because it is an illness. Being depressed is not a normal experience in the sense that it is not your baseline. The sea, trees, hug a tree. Sorry, oops. Welcome to The She Word. Conversations that women rarely have, but really should. If you're joining us on YouTube, I'm just going to remind you, somewhere underneath here, there is a subscribe button. And subscription is free. But join us, subscribe to this channel. And if you're on Spotify, exactly the same, because that means you're not going to miss a show. Also, of course, if you're joining us on YouTube or Spotify and have not yet joined us on TikTok, on Instagram, LinkedIn, or on Facebook, please do head your way there, like us or follow us, subscribe, whatever you need to do, because we have the most incredible year coming up for you. And I want to make sure that you don't miss out on anything. Now, speaking about this incredible year that's coming up, I want to just give you the heads up. We have announced and we are inviting you to get involved in the She Word Live, which is going to be at the MCC on the 24th and 25th of May. This is the first of its kind here in Malta, two dedicated days dedicated to empowering women in the workplace and women in the world. The 24th is all for you women in the workplace. Make sure you subscribe to that, get yourself joined up, signed up and come along to that. And then on the 25th, it is Women in the World. We have some of the best speakers joining us from around the globe, as well as Malta-based and Maltese women, keynote speeches, panel discussions, Q&A, meet and greet, and so much more. Head to the socials. The socials will guide you as to where you need to go to be part of this amazing event. Now, if you're a Patreon page subscriber, as I say every week, I want to say a very special thank you to you. We're very aware of the fact that sometimes we talk about topics that are really, really powerful. And just by being a Patreon subscriber, 50% of our profits from Patreon page goes straight to the Richmond Foundation to support women who need therapy or they need counseling or they need guidance, but they cannot afford it. So thank you to you Patreon subscribers because you are making a difference. If you haven't signed up to Patreon yet, do go to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash the she word, and there you're going to find exclusive content, content that comes out before anybody else gets to see it, special offers. Also, of course, part of that she word live is going to be on offer to you too. It is a great place to do amazing things. So if you're joining us here for the first time, I want to let you know, we have great topics discussed here on The She Word. Sometimes they're fun, sometimes they're entertaining, and some conversations are harder to have. And some conversations are just very, very important. In this episode, we're looking at the topic of women navigating depression. And with 10.8% of women reported to be living with depression, this is a topic that is so important to us at The She Word. You may have been facing depression, you may face it in the future, but that's a huge percentage of women living with depression right now. And I am extremely proud that we're having this conversation and extremely grateful for the women that are joining me at this table. Nikki <laughs> Vela de Fremo. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello to you. I interviewed you very f for the very first time back in 2015. We've known each yes. other for nearly a decade. By the way. <laughs> you're a mum of five, you're a professional, you're a lawyer, and you had first-hand experience of what it's like to be scrutinized in public for your mental health. You've also been outspoken. I've been assassinated. We're coming to that in a second, but you've also spout been outspoken in the media about your journey with depression, yes. uh, even when this has not been an easy or popular choice. And I'm going to let you fill in the details of that in just a moment. Joanna Bartett, 
you're an accomplished and well-known artist having exhibited what now four solo exhibitions solos another one coming up in march so next amazing month. you're also a mother of two and you've been very very open on social media with regards to your challenges related to mental health mm. and depression and eleanor mamo thank you so much for joining us you. you're a counseling psychologist how do i say this gestalt gestalt yes gestalt yeah. Oh, I'll be finding out what that is in a minute. Yeah. Uh, psychotherapist and accredited VIG practitioner. Again, I'll be looking for you in a second to fill in the details. But you are also a specialist in perinatal mental health, That's right. which is incredibly key to this discussion as well, and related depression. Definitely. That is the mental health of women who are pregnant and going all the way through until a year after giving yeah. birth. So we're going to come to you in a second. I'm so glad that you're here, and I just want to say a huge thank you before we get going for taking part thank in this you. conversation. Thank, thank you, thank you for, for really asking. Important. Well, Nikki, I want to start off with you because you jumped right in there and said <laughs> I was assassinated. I was. But tell me a little bit more about you. You, you are a public known figure. And you have spoken very, very publicly about depression. But fill in the details. Okay, so basically I was a public figure before the political disaster. But what happened was my I've always been a very carefree person, very relaxed, very outgoing, very positive. And um, what happened to me was something which I never thought was even possible. Um, I was pregnant with my second child. And um, when she was five months pregnant, I just started having suicidal thoughts. Uh, I mean, she was a very clingy child. I mean, hello, sorry about this. I'm exposing my, my daughter, but she knows about it. So it's fine. And um, she was very clingy, but it has nothing to do with her. I lost my two dogs, which people might think is very silly, but it had really affected me. And um, so I was very sad towards the end of my, towards the end of my pregnancy. And um, so uh, I had my baby. I already had my eldest one, Ali. And within five months after, I just started feeling so sad, but this overwhelming sadness, which I didn't want to show anyone. I couldn't understand what the hell was going on. It was just, you know, I would try and sort of not meet the helper in the house. I would just escape to my room with the excuse that I need to sleep because the baby was had slept all night, which wouldn't be true. I would pass by the Adorata Cemetery and say, oh, how lucky, and I'm so afraid of dying because I don't, <laughs> I don't want to die, as if. Mm. It's the last thing I want to do, I just, I love, I love life. You know, but this reminds me of a line in a Robbie Williams song. I don't want to die, but I ain't keen on living either. Yes, but and it's, it's because you want to escape that's from, the that, truth. You, from your body. From, from exactly, that, you that's, want to get away from you. From you. And anyway, so um, from then onwards, then um, one time I just decided that um, it was the end. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was just going to walk out of the house and... Um, I didn't, I didn't have any plans, so I don't think I was going to do anything. But the, the overwhelming sense of um, helplessness, darkness, not wanting to, to do anything. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't bond with my daughter. I couldn't do anything. And I'm, I was a happy mommy making fairy cakes, you know, singing and dancing in the kitchen. And, you know, that, that's me, crazy mommy, the bad mom. And um, it was gone just all of a sudden. And um, from then onwards, I, um, then, I, then I had gone to a doctor and they had um, prescribed Prozac, which he told me was to be given for six months. And within a month, I said, as if I just stopped them, which apparently is really bad to do, but I did. And I was fine. But after that, um, some silly incident would just trigger, mm. you know. Um, now, that, was, that wasn't a depression that was the bedridden depression, um, the depression became different after because the depression that I get now, rarely, but um, when it happens, it hits hard and you are, and I find myself to be bedridden, literally bedridden. I'm excited because that, that's it. Sorry, that's, well, thank no, you. I'm excited that you're sharing this story because I think mm. this is going to resonate with a lot of women and I mm. think you have a lot to say during this show. That, but that's kind of the backstory to the, the, the depression yes, journey. Yes, it started off with a post-social depression because there was absolute, I was absolutely... I'm so glad that Ellen is here because obviously we're going to touch on that. Yeah. Joanna, just 
fill in the details of who you are. You are an artist, yes. but you've also spoken I've probably out. always been an artist, but I never really claimed it. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, I do this on the side. I paint a little, even to say the word artist. Nowadays, I realize like, listen, you've been living your life because you're an artist. These things happen to you, you know, you're, you're a little bit different. So basically you have to navigate. Um, but funnily enough, the first time I had really dealt with something that I thought, okay, something's going on really badly here with me, was after I had the courage to have my first solo. Now, before yes. I had my first solo, I used to say, I will never exhibit my work because my work is very personal to me and I'd rather stand in Sweetie Road in my balcony naked than exhibit. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> have my exhibition when I'm dead. I don't want to come. I don't want to be there. Anyway, somehow people convinced me. Oh, you're I so talented. To, but I always thought, you know, I'd have An insecurity, the work I, I exhibited in that first exhibition. On certain days, I, if I had a big tub of black paint, I was capable of just, just destroying it, it all. Wow. Yes. Anyway, nothing to do really with the exhibition, but after the exhibition, where everything was be looked beautiful and I knew it, and I sold most of the work, so it was a huge success. I was so happy that I crumbled. <gasps> Okay. So I'm sorry to tell you, but no. you kind of also have no, no, no. This Anxiety is... set off, triggered by a very happy event. Like yes. this is shocking so to deal with. Really, really it's crazy, important. But I could never understand it. Like, yeah. but you know, they do. I spoke to other artists, and nobody felt it. They always said, like, ah, that's the anticlimax. No, I felt, you know, those um, when you're in a lunar park. <laughs> and there are those machines where you just hit it with an axe or a, a big hammer, and it goes brrr, to the top. And you've hit jackpot. I couldn't come down. Mm. Well, we're going to find out how your ah. journey took you to bring you back down again, because obviously this is you something... You need to level it, not go down. How different, but... Yeah. Mm. Uh, Ellen, just fill in your details, because you are our expert today. Yes. Um, so I, I've always felt a pull to this profession, like a vocation. It's something that's in the family as well. So my mother and my grandfather as well, or also in the helping profession. Um, so it was some an, a natural um, transition for me to start studying psychology um, and to pursue it and to go into my master's in Gestalt psychotherapy and my master's in counseling psychology. Um, and I find the two really support each other beautifully and uh, looking at normative population so people who are happy-go-lucky artists who are going through life and then just experience a life adjustment or something that is just doesn't feel right something that's different and how we can help navigate them through those experiences um, and face um, the demons or the difficulties that are maybe very difficult for them to actually touch upon and face so that's really my calling that's something that I feel so passionate about um, and Gestalt really merges that because it's all about dialogue and holism and seeing yourself as a whole person so I think that has given me such a lot of um, encouragement for myself to even look at my own um, journey, but also to help all these people who I've had the honor to be part of their, their own journey as well. And I'm really grateful to hear these stories and to be part um, of this podcast and hopefully support um, other women and men as well who might be hearing this and, and hearing things that would be true to them as well. Um, I had the opportunity whilst working at Mater Day to be part of the perinatal mental health clinic. And I learned so much from the midwives, the psychiatrists, the OTs, the social workers, the gynecologists who formed part of that team. And we had the GP as well, a pediatrician. So there's this whole multidisciplinary team that are there and ready to, to support, plus all the therapeutic um, team as well at the psychology department who are there on a governmental level, obviously, um, to provide support to these women and men um, when possible um, to I don't know, just go through pregnancy and the postpartum period, mm. which is beautiful and the best time of your life. Ellen, you touch, you mentioned just a second ago about a big event in someone's life and how that can actually trigger yeah. depression. You also talked about this perinatal depression, which 
touches on Nikki's yes, journey. Yeah. Is there a link between the fantastic. two? Fantastic. Well, hang on a second, because I'm going to also just share a little bit of my story and then some statistics. You guys are just, you're amazing. But you, you mentioned back there just a second ago, Nikki, you mentioned about Prozac. And in 1998, I was prescribed in the UK uh, that I had depression. And I was prescribed a, a drug called Siroxat, which was supposed to be the new Prozac. And this was 1998, so it's a, not even in this century. And unfortunately, the the side effects, whilst they said it was not um, addictive, back then it was brand new to the market, brand new to the market. And the, the recommended dose was 20 milligrams a day because the side effects were so uh, incredible. Nobody could get me off it. Mm -hmm. And I end up being on 60 milligrams a day. And we're going to talk about that Prozac. We're going to talk about how to mm. treat. And you just mentioned about being yeah. proactive. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to run through some statistics. Then I'm going to throw the conversation onto the table and you guys can run with it. Mm -hmm. So as recently as the 1950s, individuals who grappled with mental health disorders were deemed unfit to live independently within the realms of a community and were often committed to mental hospitals, which were known as mental institutions. And I say, I'd love to say that that is only existing in the 1950s. No way that it just is, a, is confined to the 1950s. Key findings in the National Center for Health Statistics show that more than 8% of adults older than 20 years old reported having depression during any given two-week period. Women uh, were almost twice as likely as men who reported depression. And I want to be very reported. clear about this because these statistics are only referring to, and we talked about this yeah. before, they're only referring to the people who have reported mm. having depression. 10.4% of women and 5.5% of men. And this is exactly mm. why later on in the year we'll be having the he word because we believe that these statistics are also skewed. Of that means course. that about 280 million people worldwide live with depression and are known according to the WHO, which is the World Health Organization. Who? The World <laughs> Oh, I owe you. Got me there. She was going to have to keep an eye on Nikki. I'm telling you. Someone move the wine away. <laughs> depression is more common in people who give birth, in mothers. 10% of pregnant women and new mums who experience uh, experience depression according to who <laughs> and depression can be hereditary we already touched on this before we came yes, onto the yes, show yes. people who have an immediate family member living with depression may have two to three times greater risk of having depression according to stanford medicine so i want to just i'm going to sit back in a second and let you guys do all of the work but I want to start off by asking one question. And I think, Nikki, you probably have more experience than this personally than most, but I'm, that's just a huge assumption simply because of your public um, persona. If depression is affecting 10% of women at any one time that are known, so we can estimate that the statistics are much higher, why are there still issues addressing the topic and we're not talking about mental health at this moment because mental health and depression i would say are actually not exactly the same thing mental health issues you know cover a broad spectrum and we're talking mm. specifically about depression why are there still issues talking about this in 2024 there's so much shame trudy oh. it's very shameful to, it's actually like the d words you know what if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works, in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns.
it is, it falls within the category of mental health illness. So we're talking about illness. Now, depression is the mildest form of mental health illness. It's, I, not, I even, it's not even an I illness, it's a condition. That. I wouldn't say it could be the mildest form because it's the one that triggers suicidal ideas. Exactly. Yes, yes. yes. I'm thinking. An extremity, an extremity. But what happens is this, and I'm not one to teach you, but from my own personal experience, mm -hmm. it's it's the, the whole thing, the whole issue is this, that when I, you said that I was a public figure. Yes, I was a public figure before um, I was catapulted into the, unwillingly into the political sphere. And I was, um, my mental health condition, which was depression, which was caused by postpartum depression, and which was um, accentuated by the fact that um, I unwittingly found myself in the political realm, um, was used against me by the people who I thought were on my side. Mm. So instead of having me um, supported and having a supportive um, I don't know, team or my, my depression was uh, manipulated to make me seem that I was some kind of crazy person because I'm quite um, an opinionated person and I don't, no. I don't, I don't, um, mm. I don't tolerate any, any form of wrongdoing or any form of, um, I don't know, well, if I think something is wrong or if I think that, or if I sort of say something and then you sort of like turn on to me and say, no, you didn't say that. I mean, intense gaslighting. Okay. Um, sorry, I thought you were stopping me. No, I know, no, because you said something, and I'm, I'm, my menopausal pausal brain frog is, is, is doing this because you said something that just really, really triggered a massive thought in my head. We had this conversation. Nikki said about it being the most extreme, and whether it is extreme or not extreme. No, it's not extreme. No, but I just want to ask a question that relates to what both these ladies also said. We use the term. So if you talk about something like bipolar, or you talk about yeah, something... Yeah, but they accuse me of being bipolar. Hang on a second, hang on a second. Or schizophrenia, hang on a second. If you use those terms, those are terms that are, I would consider a extreme. A scale higher. But we it's all say, I feel a yes. bit... But don't we all say from time to time, yeah. I feel a bit depressed? And so we normalize... But no, but you know the difference is... I know people there is don't, a difference. People don't understand the difference between being sad Ooh, and being depressed. That's, that's I'm really depressed. Hurting. When you're sad, yeah, come on, when you're like depressed, smile, you don't, make us laugh. When you're depressed, mm. you don't even have, I mean, I, I can say for myself, when I'm depressed, and thank God for my children because they understand me so well and they are my saving grace, you don't even have the strength to get out of bed, have a shower. You don't even have the strength to turn around and reach out for a bottle of water. Sure. So you just... Like a vegetable, it, it's it is it's just true. so debilitating. So there are the when you're sad, you cry. You cry. Elena, we need we need life. we yeah. need a classification of so. the difference between mental health issues, depression, and feeling depressed. Because yeah. so, I think we want to clarify yes, this. Yes, I think. As you said, feeling depressed, feeling sad is something that we all go through. It's normally you have the ups and downs, the cycles of life mm -hmm. um, that we do experience. But when you are depressed, when you are clinically depressed, when you have gone through a period of feeling the way you're feeling, maybe not even as severe all the time for a two week period, then you can say that you are experiencing depression. So that is one of the clinical two weeks. Two weeks. So if you're feeling like you can't get out of bed. Can't get out of bed. No, not, not only, not because there is there are different levels. No, people who of actually are happy, and then next day you find out that they commit suicide. So well, that's it, a mask. Eh? No, but so there's a happy learn, depression. People learn how to mask what they are going mm. through because of the self stigma, Aim. the shame that they experience, and the inability to say I'm, I'm not okay. Look, I I can tell you one thing. If you called me to take part in this, and I was feeling really depressed, like I was, or anxious. There's no way I would talk about it. Not even people who know me well knew. I would have gone out mm. of bed. Some people knew because I, I knew that they weren't going to judge me. But there's a lot of judgment. Yeah. I know. There's even people are going to see this being advertised. You know, mm, Mijnuna, you know what she's doing. That's she's going to say. Cuckoo, you know, this woman. Exactly. But then, for example, you're at the hairdresser and you give a little hint Everyone that you talking. have anxiety, which is safer than saying you have depression. In fact, on Facebook, I barely use the word, the proper word, depression. I use anxiety. I use 
anxiety is kind of okay. Panic attacks also, which is like the most, oh. the scariest thing you can experience. But for some mad reason, it's okay. It's almost cool, and almost. We, we, I don't know why. Why? I, I just want to, before we go down there, because we, we've, but this is a big topic. But, but But you've, you both said such powerful things in the first five minutes. And I just want to keep bringing this back to what is the difference between anxiety between mental health, between something that, that we, you know, we were talking there about what is a more extreme. Yeah. And depression. Let's let's just make sure we're talking about depression. We said yes. two weeks. If you're feeling depressed. If you're feeling apathetic, riddled with guilt, worthless, tearful, um, change in moods, obviously appetite, your behavior starts changing, a sense of isolation, feeling worthless, hopefully oh. not, but suicidal ideation as well can also be part of the mm. presentation um, of, of depression. So it's not just feeling depressed. So it's not something that passes because you've seen something sad on television mm. or you're going through just a difficult moment. Or someone alcohol. hurts you with some words yeah. or you get a disappointment because you were planning on but something that doesn't work out. That's at the sadness. same time, it's just it's a, different. A, like you're in the abyss. You're just, it's just so a when deep, you go, dark and hole. There are different it's, levels. So there are different severities of depression. So in a sense, we look at uh, the mild, the moderate and the severe. Mm -hmm. So when someone is going through suicidal ideation, uh, bedridden for days, they don't shower, they don't change and um, they can't tend to their children, for example, we would look at that as severe mental health. But that causes a lot of shame in itself. Of course. Cause of like course. to wake up like at 7 a.m. And pretend you didn't wake up till like 10, 30, 11. You say, oh God, yeah. I woke up. I'm and then you have alive. to wake up and you're like, yeah, okay, now walk to the kitchen. You're going to be fine. Walk to the Honestly, kitchen. Walk. Yeah. You're going I to be fine. I wouldn't manage. Put the clothes in the machine. You sit down to put the clothes in the machine and you can't stand up. And it so, takes you five minutes. You're sitting on the floor like, yeah, you can do it. Get up. Get you so that. what, I'm what you, you're off, picking huh? up on, what you're picking up on is the self-talk. You can do it. Um, okay, you've got this kind it's of... It's a big struggle, huh? Of course it's a big struggle. It's, it's very exhausting. But you're a hero, huh, for me. Yeah, but but it's, so it's not fun. Who oh, cares if of you're course. a hero? I want no, to do well. No, yeah. but, no, but I, I am not even capable of doing that. The severity of um, my depression was extenuated when people, you know, who didn't even know me, um, decided to label me and um, even being in the political within a political party, my mental health was used as a tool to weaken me. Mm -hmm. And so it became, um, and this I'm really glad and I really make, make sure that this goes public. I was so sick and tired of being labeled as um, mad and I was deemed to be, well, I was classified as big by, by certain people and the rumor was spread that I was bipolar. Now, if I was bipolar, I'm so verbal and I'm so outspoken. You'd say it. That I would say it. I have absolutely no shame in saying that I suffer from depression and I have so, so much shame, no shame whatsoever, but a lot of guilt insofar as my children are concerned, because otherwise I don't give a damn exactly. what anybody says, because I've been crucified to the bone. But when I meet people and they tell me, for example, um, you know, because uh, I say, because you know, people say that I'm bipolar. Yes, I've heard it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what the hell? So, what, so what's wrong if I was bipolar? And what is wrong if somebody suffers and is a, you know, a person who has bipolar Disease. The thing is it? this, I've, I've noticed. But how dare you, how dare you invent and try and use someone's weakness because they are a threat and because it's a vulnerability. But don't they, don't you get people who tell you me too? Because I've been, like I was going to say before, you're sitting at the hairdresser and you kind of give a little hint that you're on some kind of medication, which thank God now I'm not. But at one time I was on four different types. Nothing ever helped me good for you if medication helps you take it. I'm not saying you shouldn't take medication. No, you have to. Food when I, have, yeah. in my case, never found a, medication helpful. It can be a huge resource. Yeah, so but tough. in my case, no. no I still me. carry a Sedoxil in my bag wherever I go in case of a panic attack. But a safety it there. stays there probably but six months. But sometimes extreme whatever. depression. But I mean, I've noticed people. that if I'm at the hairdresser, for example, usually at the hairdresser, there are strangers. And you bring up a slight hint, because you're like putting out a feeler there, about 
anxiety or medication. Because you think you need to talk about it, say. Nine or 8.5 times out of 10, the two people on either side are going to say, me too. Yeah. I'm on this. I've been on this since I was 18. And these people look sorted. As much as she looked so. I once saw Nikki <laughs> on the cover of The Circle. And I used to think, oh my God, this woman has it all sorted. She has five, five kids, right? Five, yeah. She's a, a successful so lawyer. <laughs> Beautiful. Like, as, sure. for me, it seemed like she had it all. But isn't a, this a way? great marriage? But I really stopped Little talking about depression I know now, then. That this person, I hadn't started suffering from depression. I just, she just had all my, I admired her. How we never know what's going on beneath the mask. Beneath I, was the really, I had already spoken out about. I didn't know about, about that. About Maybe I, 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 I don't have ADHD. Snake. I don't read. No, probably, probably I just saw the pictures. But no, the pictures, yes. But um, the the whole point is this: that when you look at a person, when I first met Trudy, for example, I mean, she was so bubbly, and so um, and still is, and. Even me, for example, you know, when you meet me on a good day, not, I mean, if I'm on, it's a bad time, you won't see me because I'm like, like a slug in bed, you know. Mm. But when I met her and then I read her story about her, you know, having, I mean, if I can mention it, I mean, your, your suicide attempt, her harming herself. I thought, what the hell? This is Trudy. She's, she looks like such a, an extrovert, such a positive person. I mean, there was no way in hell that I was even society imagined. society tells you you need to be a you know, that you was, and you were thing, a sufferer if, like I was. If I can jump in here, it's the inability that we have to be able to hold that someone so bubbly and positive can also at the same time experience extreme hardship. And I think that difficulty of holding two very opposing emotions within the same person can cause that shame of being like, if I'm this happy and bubbly and creative, how can I be going through a depression? It doesn't no, fit. It's, it's, it doesn't hit me like that. I there have is, a story but, about bubbly. I'll tell you, there remind is something me. Else. There is something else that's involved in that. And I was very fortunate because I, depression and, and my challenges were related specifically to a period of time that I was going through and a divorce and a separation that I was going through and his behavior, which, you know, you talked about triggering mm -hmm. there being a triggered event, mm -hmm. the triggered event, which Marcus sparked my depression was getting married. Mm. I know. And this is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. I, I walk, like my exhibition. I walked down the aisle. Yeah. Like my life. I <laughs> Well, I walked down the aisle, you know, knowing that it wasn't going to work and it oh, triggered, triggered depression straight after yeah, that. Yeah. And because that's you're not how, I ended, up, how I ended up in that circumstances. Yeah. But absolutely, I 200% believe, and I'm very lucky because that was... that was. But did you find yourself um, sort of like... Because depression, I, I feel, comes back sometimes and hurls its ugly head. Yes, of course. And it whacks you in the head. Yes. And every time it whacks you harder and harder and harder. I think, and we're going to come to this, we're going to come to coping mechanisms in a, a, further on in the show. Okay. But I think that there are signs. I don't think you ever sort of like... Yeah. I think there are, for me, there are signs that something is... No, I'm heading in a mm -hmm. direction. I have one thing that I... A habit that I have that I'm still... My nearly 50 years, I'm still trying to break. And I know when that comes that that's a dodgy ground for me. Mm. It doesn't come very often, but when it comes, no, when it comes yeah. I recognize it and I know that I need to take some action. I need to be around people or I need to do, and it's the last thing that you want to do. What you really want to exactly. do is go home, oh my grab God. yourself a bottle of wine, hey, drink the whole lot and take, you know. For me, it was Netflix. But then I, you know what, that's when I was good. terribly <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, no, honestly, when I was so wine, terribly yes. bad. I just drink my tea. We're, we're yeah, gonna come and watch to those. Netflix, and I can't remember anything. We're gonna come hey. to those. Even, even those months. What happened? It's blank. Um, we're gonna blank. Come, we're gonna come to those coping mechanisms and also those symptoms in a second. I want to just still nail this topic. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking over the okay, show. I, we're I, stealing I her want, questions. <laughs> I want to nail this question, and yeah. and Eleanor has something that she wants to say. She's put her hand up because she's <laughs> sitting with the Eleanor. amazing woman. We're going to be doing this. Whoever's, whoever's holding, <laughs> let me put it like this: whoever's holding the nuts gets to oh, speak. Can we right? Open yeah. Hold the nuts and hold the nuts tightly. There's some hot ones. <laughs> 
You can't stop me. Nikki's got a whole bunch of nuts in her hands. I have, I have nuts. Oh, I'm telling you, I have nuts. Eleanor, <laughs> we're going to come to you because we're yeah. still. I believe we're still tackling this topic of why the shame, why, yes. why the the execution, the public execution. Why, if there are, let's say, there's ten percent of women experiencing depression, yeah. not feeling a bit blue depression yeah. right now and we're saying that that's a very conservative estimate because i'm pretty sure that you ladies when you had depression the last thing that you wanted to do is go and register i've got depression no, you won't talk or, about it so what is it what is the shame about jump in because you're jumping to get in there i don't think there's an answer to why there is no one answer to why something happens it would be a whole barrage of different events, internal and external, and something that you mentioned, coping strategies, but also protective factors that we need to also consider that can support someone to reach out. Because when you are in that state, like like Joanna was saying, and, and, and even Nikki, you're not going to go up and say, ah, I need help. I need to speak to somebody. I, I need to, I, I'm not okay. Because the type of the way that you're speaking to yourself is so negative usually. The way you're seeing yourself, the world around you, just no hope. Everything mm -hmm. is just exactly no hope, this sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And helplessness is one of the features of depression. So how can you help yourself get out of this place? It puts on the guilt and guilt is also another factor that contributes to feeling depressed because you want to put the load in and then go mm. do something else in the house and take care of the kids and walk the dog. But you just don't have the motivation and you don't feel like. So there's this, all of these things going on inside of you that then just stop you from doing what you need to be done. And that is so difficult to connect with and, and to, to face. So I think that is one of the internal reasons as to why. An external reason is we don't have this conversation. Hmm. So people might not say, ah, okay, so this is not what I'm meant to be feeling every winter. Mm. This is not as dark as normal as dark as for me to be feeling and to be thinking about myself and the world in this way. So maybe reaching out will help. And there's that at least that question. So hopefully this conversation and conversations like this that will be triggered through this podcast can help someone identify themselves but also identify others i mean this is why i came on the show i wouldn't bother you know yeah. which i think well, is well, absolutely I mean, beautiful. for me the wine and the nuts but that's <laughs> well, but before I we I would I bother if I, you know how many i got hundreds, hundreds of messages anyone. hundreds and um with people asking um you know men and women who um battled uh, depression who were driven to um addiction because of depression who um, have been seeking psychiatric help and psychological help to no avail, are swallowing 16 tablets a day and nothing seems to help them, their son or whatever. And, and they're so ashamed and they send you a private, a private message because they tell, they tell me, you know, I don't post it on your, on your mm -hmm. chat. And um, it, 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 it breaks my heart because yeah. it, there's really nothing to be ashamed of. Because And you know what? I say that I'm a... a a sufferer, I am, I battle depression mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's, I'm not a sufferer. I'm not a victim. I battle it because it is an illness. Somebody told me, somebody sent me a, um, a, a, a message and he said, um, I'm glad that you're handling your problem. I said, Ma, problem. That's so condescending. I said, but I, did, I, didn't, I didn't bother. I said, problem. It's not a problem. It's a condition. I said, so if you break your leg, I said, would you just leave it, you know, dangling al al along? Or would you go and have it fixed and put it plas have it plastered? Which, Nikki, leads me very nicely into another question because I'm wanting to get to the basics. You've exactly just there hit the nail on the head. My next question to you is, we know that depression can be heter hereditary, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important to absolutely qualify this what causes a woman or a man to experience, in our case, a woman, because there are other factors which influenced you, to experience depression? I'm going to get you guys to just hold off and hold your nuts just for a second. Is it, because I want to ask, is it 
physiological influences? Is it psychological influences? Is it hereditary influences? Or is it a combination of all? These ladies are full of life, beautiful, stunning women. And both of them have been hit by depression at the point of (laughs) their lives when you think that they should be celebrating. See how full of life they are. Exactly. (laughs) That's my point. It's the nuts. It's the nuts and the wine. But, um, (laughs) But what causes depression just be, because i want to blow this away because as you said anybody anybody can be affected by depression yep. if we if we don't know why we can't actually yes. qualify it so i'm going to let eleanor speak for a second from a professional viewpoint mm. i love to <laughs> So it is It is a combination of everything. So yes, there is a hereditary component. There is the physiological. There is the psychological. There is the behavioral as well. So I think a case in point, COVID, we've all experienced mm-hmm. it. The mental health um, of the nation, of the world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. during this time and how it severely impacted so many people because there was the environmental block of you can't meet people especially elderly, um, but even those who... Surgeries have escalated. I mean, it's it's crazy what the environment can do to you, even the environment that you work in, the environment that you live in, how important art is, because if you... Yeah, so we have the environmental, mm-hmm. okay, because I just want to, I want to get to... Yeah. We've got environmental impact. So if somebody's watching this show and yeah. they're thinking about, am I vulnerable to depression yes. am i experienced experiencing depression we've got first of all we've got environmental we know yes. covid caused like you just nodded it caused a lot of anxiety yes for all of us now we, no, like, I, we no, also I loved it you loved it but the rest I of us were a little it. bit anxious but it, it, it caused mobile. it caused anxiety for a lot of people yes. but for some people that pushed across into depression yes so we've got environmental yes there's also physiological for example if you've had um if you've had a period of time where you're not sleeping well, so you're not getting enough sleep in, and that can also affect your nervous system, your limbic system, and that can also affect um, your mental health. The okay. hormones. Your also. hormones, exactly. So, um, so going, yeah. through, going through puberty um, as an adolescent girl, going through pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, um, these all affect um, on a physiological and biological level, all of these changes in hormones um, and life um, experiences do affect your mental health and obviously can trigger depression. Depression is obviously not the only thing that can be triggered, but we do know that um, depression is one of the things that can be triggered on a physiological level as well. It is about blinking time that society just woke up and accepted the fact that somebody is depressed not judge them or label them because they're depressed. You're right. You know, Mm -hmm. because ultimately so many people and because of COVID and me obviously always being the weirdo, I liked COVID because I had my my kids all at home. I didn't have to give lifts. Um, Mm -hmm. I just... that's another thing. You didn't have to go out. What I want to take away from the question that I asked... Yes. ...is that there really isn't... I've used this phrase before on this show... There is a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, Mm -hmm. there needs to be a number of factors that come together, whether they're uh, hereditary, physiological, psychological. It could be an event. In your instance, I mean, I'm quite sure somebody would say to you, you got depression after the best day of your life. Exactly, that's what everyone said. And with regards to yourself, you've just had a child and and you have other factors. But what we're saying is that there's not a recipe. We can't go through a checklist going, okay, this, 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 you've got depression. But truly, it it stems from childhood. eh? It could. So we build an image of ourselves from the day we're born and even in utero. So we are constantly evolving and trying to understand who we are. We're making sense of the world. So we create these internal working models, we would call it. So the way you view yourself, the way you view your world um, from childhood, from from day one. And if from day one you're told, "Mm, 
you're, you're not very good at this or you can't do much better than that or look at your brother, how amazing he is or um, always being put down or compared. And there's this repetitive cycle or experiencing childhood trauma, whether it's domestic violence, witnessing or experiencing unfortunate events, losses, early losses, um, having a mother who isn't being able to be present or a father who isn't being able, who isn't able to be present. That could also affect your worldview, not just of the world, but generational. also generational. Of yourself. In- Generational. I mean, okay. like my age, my age bracket, mm-hmm. our parents were subjected to war. Yes. They were infants. Mm-hmm. For example, my mom was born in the bedroom of her home and taken straight down to the shelter. Now, imagine oh. what fear there was in that yes. room, you know? Yes. Like bombs are, like oh. it can happen any minute. You could but be then this is where the perfect storm comes in and the protective factors come in. Because not everybody who experienced war and who is experiencing war... Um, suffers from depression and suffers from trauma. Some people are, um, we are all made differently internally and through the environment and through what we experience and how we make sense of what we experience. So let me ask you a question because it coming back to something that no, everyone, (laughs) not just you, not just you. Nikki Nikki said something a second ago. Nikki was very insistent that that depression is normalized. And this is why we're doing this show. If there is a perfect storm Mm -hmm. of contributing factors that comes together to make somebody somebody's experience lean towards depression and head down and we're going to come to this in a second about the sliding we talk about sliding into depression Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that in a second because i think that's very very important if these contributing factors all come together perfect storm you said and i'm just going to touch on that but somebody else might have an exhibition and their exhibition is the best day of their life Mm. and they don't go into depression afterwards that's a normal thing but your perfect storm contributed to that and likewise for you Nikki you're saying normalize this if this if this is the fact that we need to normalize this and we also Joe just mentioned about people going through trauma which is the war lots of and you just said Eleanor that lots of people go through trauma lots of people go through having babies lots of people go through having well, probably not exhibitions, but they go through <laughs> these these experiences, yeah. and some people are are touched by depression, and some are not. Mm-hmm. The truth is that it is a perfect storm of circumstances that comes together to create this entity. We still, as a society, see it as weakness. In all that is in some per- people's experience, they'll go through the same the same experience that Joe went through or that Nikki went through, they don't have depression because there may just be one component, one single component. The perfect storm, right? Uh It has to take a perfect, am I right in thinking that? Yes, we're all different and we see the world differently. No two people, not even identical twins, have the exact same view of life, of themselves, because they are different people. So it's completely normal to feel like, but it doesn't make sense. Do you have to be an empath? To have depression or no, no, no. Can it affect anyone? It can affect anyone. Just something I want to say about normalizing depression. I think it's about normalizing speaking about depression, normalizing reaching out because being depressed is not a normal experience in the sense that it is not your baseline. No, of course not. So I think it is so important because someone might take it for granted in the sense that it's no big deal, normalize depression. I'm depressed, mm. so it's okay. No, no, but so listen, I just want to make okay sure. to be depressed. You know what? Because you have to understand that I am I will never accept and I will never tolerate being looked down upon because I suffer from depression and I went I had a post on Facebook and um which during a, a, an awful time in my life where my mental health was used against me. And you know what? You can function even though you suffer from depression and I function very, very well. So I think this is something that you should own. And it is beautiful that you were able to function whilst you experienced depression. Not no, I ev- wasn't able to. I, I, had to, I had to fight for survival. Yes. Now, in survival mode, I functioned. But having said that, <laughs> when it comes to being depressed in an ordinary you know, matter of events, yeah. I don't function because yes. I have to fight for myself. Yes. When I have to fight for others... Even if it's if it's for my children, because my children are used to not used to. So I don't. I, it happens to me once in a blue moon. But I mean, were it not for my children, 
I probably would never come out of it because my children come in. I mean, they're the, they're the sweetest and the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, five, yes, everyone thinks I'm crazy. Yes, I am. <laughs> but they come in and they check on me and they tell me, Mark, you're going to be okay, you know? And they see me in a very horrible, horrible place. But having said that, nobody has the right. I'm, I'm saying about depression should be normalized because so many people suffer from depression because it is like the baseline. It is like the the the, the sort of like step one. 10.8%. You know? But what, what Ellen but, is saying. But what they do, they say, no, she has this. But, she, but, Nikki, but that's what, not what depression. Ellen is, no, what it's Ellen... not. But other people will judge you and they use your depression to make you seem because when you go a bit higher than depression for example you say that somebody's bipolar or they're psychotic and they start hearing voices when you go that step higher then they sort of feel even more justified to consider you as mad depression is already enough to consider you as being off your rocker But hang on a second. What Eleanor is saying, I think we're, we're having the same conversation. Let's clarify this because you put it beautifully. We're not normalizing depression. We're normalizing the conversation about mm. depression. So in other words, we're saying that in that perfect storm, any single, f and I'm going to put it out there, and Eleanor, you maybe want to, as a professional, just... Just, I'm pretty sure that you ladies would agree with this. Any single person on this planet, given the right conditions, will suffer from depression. And any, any, any person on the planet single, will thrive under the right conditions. Exactly. And here, and this is yes. why. This That's is the beauty why. of it, because you can and, and come out of it. In fact, if I was still depressed, I wouldn't come on the show. Why would I? Because it's very relevant to what you just said. But, but Eleanor, I'm going to let you hold the nuts. So... <laughs> so I think it's really, really important to say that there is a way to get support. It is not terminal cancer. There is a lifetime effect of recurrency of depression that is um, research that is um, statistically proven that once you have experienced one bout of depression, you are more likely Bro. to experience it again. But it doesn't mean that it is a life sentence. So, but you can function. You so can function. You can function, but you can also learn about, as, as Trudy was saying, your triggers, um, what are your red flags, how can you cope? So what are the self-care mechanisms that you can? It could be depression, could be something else as well, obviously. But um, what I'm trying to say is that um, how important it is to get to know yourself, mm -hmm. to seek mm -hmm. help, to be able to sure. see what it is that you need to remain healthy and to identify when you are experiencing going down the slide to use your what, metaphor. Exactly. And this is what I wanted to ask. And I'm yeah. going to ask Joe first, and then I'm going to come to you, Nikki. So hang on to your nuts. Timmy. I'm going to keep saying this. Hang on to your nuts, girlfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, plenty it's for me. Nikki I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the use, We use a term, sliding into depression. Mm. You slide into depression. And it kind of... It kind of reiterates what you just said back there because I myself notice triggers and if I don't pull myself up on those triggers, mm -hmm. I know that that's heading into a certain direction. I'm very blessed. I've not been in that position for at least two decades, Amazing. if not more. Love me, that's but, fantastic. Amazing. But I have to, as you said, you have to, to notice mm -hmm. what those what those vulnerable points are mm -hmm. and how you can take action. I want to ask you, Joe, and I'm coming to you in a second, Nikki, because I feel like I need to just I reassure swear, Nikki. I'm, I feel like I'm at school. I'm always <laughs> in trouble. I just want to ask, because I give it to you. <laughs> we talk about this term sliding mm -hmm. into depression. We've talked about the perfect storm. 
about all of these contributing factors coming together, which could be absolutely anything. We can't define and say that one experience is worse or one experience is more prevalent than others. In your case, you came out of your first solo exhibition. You obviously had other elements that contributed. I wasn't aware of them. To your perfect mm -hmm. storm. You may not have known, yeah. but did you sense a slide? Were you aware that things were getting worse? Not then, but now can you see that? Yes, I can. I can. Talk to me about that. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of things, like little things. For example, when you start getting anxiety attacks and you go to a professional and they give you medication, I used to think you get some kind of, you're going to get help. In a, in a sense, it is with medication in relation to finding the right medication and the right dose for you. So finding a psychiatrist who you trust and building a therapeutic relationship with your psychiatrist, to be honest, like talking about different things, that side effects. So you need to see what works for you and everybody is different. So if you've tried the medication prescribed and you're getting these heavy nightmares, you're waking up, then you need to schedule another, another appointment with that psychiatrist say, listen, these did not work for me. Yeah. Yes. And, and and I'm going to reiterate what Nikki said, because even with therapists, yeah. even with if therapists, you don't find sure. a relationship with that person Change. whom you trust, seek out somebody who works for you. Yes, because for we sure. cannot imagine that walking into the first therapist office or a first psychiatrist office, that they're going to understand you off the bat and they're going to know exactly what you need. The brain. It, this is, it's this complex. Is a, it's complex. And so what works for her you find the might right not relationship. work for, for me. So picking up on resources, resources are, are so important and we need to utilize, especially when you're feeling so helpless and worthless and in the abyss, like we've been saying, the resources are the most important thing, which are so difficult to tap into. Medication, unfortunately, didn't work for you, but it, they do work for so many people yeah. when they have the right um, treatment and sometimes even the combination. So sometimes we look at combination therapy where um, there is a medication that is prescribed to help with the daily functioning, um, like Nikki mentioned before, um, to get their routine going again and to get a bit closer to baseline so that therapy can then support even more in the understanding and also in the exercises and the support that can um, help. So Ellen, just, just to reiterate what you were saying there, mm -hmm. What you're suggesting is that a medication, if someone is prescribed medication, yeah. one of the purposes of medication is just to boost you so that you can actually move to the next stage. Yes, so for you sure. You can actually go and get therapy and deal with what the underlying issues are. Yeah. Because when you're in a state like that, in a, in a deep depression, as I'm sure you ladies have experienced, the last thing in the world that you want to do is actually go and sit in a chair and speak about it. So you're suggesting that medication, if it works for you, and it doesn't work in all cases, but if yeah. it does work for you, is literally just to elevate you to be able to go to the next stage of being able to deal with the depression. Yes. To, to retain information, to be able to do the therapeutic tasks, to be able to come together with yourself and with your coping, um, sorry, sorry, support network, to be able to support yourself to create the right environment for yourself, like you mentioned, Joe, as well, and um, to be able to come out of that depression, to get off the slide sometimes. Um, and it, you, it's very hard to do it alone. And like we've been saying, you're not alone. So utilize that support system. Who do you have in your corner? And I think, which is very unfortunate for Nikki, there were people in your corner, but there were a lot of people against mm -hmm. you um, very publicly, which I think in a sense, is a unique experience, in a, in a sense, thankfully for, for the people who are watching this, that there, are, there aren't many people in the public eye, I guess, or there are more people not. I, I guess that was... I, I mean, I'm dying to ask Nikki about her experience, mm -hmm. and we'll come to that in just a second, Nikki, because I think your experience of having to go through your darkest days under, under the gaze of the media is just, for me horrific mm. having experienced yeah, I'm actually eating palpitations we're going to let you just ease your palpitations and I'm going to come back to Joe because we are coming to you in a second but Joe just to talk about that sliding for a second I was asking you now 
because I think this is really useful and I think it's really important to anybody that's listening to this. You were going through a sliding journey that you can see now, Mm -hmm. but maybe, I mean, let's face it, when you're in depression, you can't see things in a rational, logical, Mm -hmm. uh, reasoned basis. You can't see things in the same way that you can if you are on sad. top form, if you're out Even of if you're that. if you're sad. Exactly. But you know what? One thing I want to say is that when you're in the abyss, wait, you have to cling on knowing that there is that light She's right. and it's going to happen and cling on to that knowledge. Is the it's going to happen in a week, two weeks, but it's, it's going to happen. You're yeah. going to get out of it. She's right. So let's let's tackle, because this is a positive message and I want this as well, but let's keep on this theme because I want to identify for okay. anybody who's watching or listening what that journey looks like for you. Okay. So you tried medication. So medication I tried the medication work. for anxiety I, and I felt worse. Um, obviously, it was like, it's not logical, you know, you're supposed to be feeling better. So you're panicking that you're not feeling better and you're even more scared and you're like, Oh my God, this is because I'm an artist. You know, yeah. in history, a lot of artists like do themselves in. So like, what's going to happen to me? Um, but then you start to sort of quiet, quiet down and like the things you enjoyed no longer make sense to you. Mm-hmm. I remember when COVID, we had that little space in summer mm. between the first bout of COVID yeah. and the second one. I remember. And we were kind of allowed to go out. And I used to think to myself, okay, we have a day by the pool at somebody's house. (gasps) I can't go. What am I going to say? Me, you know, I can't shut my mouth for a second. And I was worried. (laughs) What am I going to say? It takes everything out of you. You're not there anymore. So every day you wake up and you're like, Madonna, who is this woman Mm -hmm. living inside me? Whose wardrobe was this? Who used to create paintings? Who would laugh? Who would say, oh, you know what I want to do? This, this, and this. She's gone. Mom would cry. Horrible. Horrible. But the worst, and I forgot about this, somebody who has depression reminded me lately that you don't know what to say. You're telling yourself. I'm sitting there in a group of people and you're like, what shall I say? What shall I say? You can't formulate the thoughts. Mm. You're no longer verbal. That's why you want to stay in bed. Because your system is shutting down. And no one really knows this. And it's so difficult, you know. And you're sh- the biggest feeling you get is shame. Shame. I mean, I can remember an actual episode where I was at the beach. Somebody dra- dragged me to the beach as I wanted to sleep. And they talked about, oh, I made this really nice dish yesterday, this new recipe. And I'm like, you see, you're terrible. You can't even cook anymore. Mm. You're a piece Aww. of sh- beep. I wasn't driving. I wasn't painting. For me to go across the road to buy a packet of chips. I'm like, okay, honey, you can do it. Go, go. Shower, brush your teeth, do your hair, walk across and buy. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to pay it? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It really does that to you. And it was an escalated... It kept getting worse. It kept getting worse. It kept getting worse. We're going to come back to you in a second because I want to discuss... But you don't oh. recognize yourself. That's the worst thing. And now I have the positive story. In the end, I'll tell you. No, we're There's something c- positive that comes no, out of absolutely. this. Absolutely. And uh, we are not staying in that dark hole. No, we you don't have going, to stay are, in that dark hole. We are going to, in a second, we're going to discuss your journey and Nikki's journey have brought you out at least to a point where you can talk about it. No. I'm coming back to you, Nikki, because I want to but just talk. talk about this, this slide. Your would you say that you can recognize that Slide. your depression was triggered by postnatal depression? Yes. And then would you say that it was escalated? I mean, you like I said, you, we're going to talk I about pretty we're going to talk unique. about the positive and how to get out of it in a minute. But before we get there, so that anybody who's listening or watching can identify what that looks like, you obviously went through all of this in the public eye, which again, as I reiterate, none of us, none of us can even possibly imagine what it's like to go through your darkest times under the scrutiny of everybody who has access to media. But you're going through, talk to me about this. You went through postnatal. Mm-hmm. Then I was you're fine. depressed. And then I had 
couple of bouts of depression. Then I found myself in the, I, I was always a public person because of, obviously because of my career and because I was the lawyer of a porch. And I was always um, dealing with cases of domestic violence. So family law was, I've been a lawyer for 25 years. So for 20 years, I've been dealing with, with separations and cases of specializing in child abuse and domestic violence. Wow. So it's, for me, it was the norm because when you go to court, like I said, there's an alter ego. Nikki, that you know, is not the Nikki of court. Mm. God forbid. Because I make a really crap lawyer. But um, when I um, found myself in the public eye um, as an individual and I spoke about my depression and whatever, it was taken, um, it was welcomed. It was actually welcomed. Um, however, when I was in the public eye as being a sort of like... Um, a prosthesis of somebody else. I, um, I politics is a very dirty game, and unfortunately, I found myself um, being my mild depression because I, I don't really suffer from severe depression because it's bad. Yes, I, I I can't get out of bed, but I can't say that it's it's it's, it's so bad. I, I never get suicidal thoughts. I just I just say, oh god, another day. I have to deal with the the kids and the house is flying and you know I mean I'm going through a separation and so obviously the way I live is not at all the way that I used to live before um because that's the justice system for you um now having what happened is that my depression was used as a tool um to silence me now I am not a person who, to be silenced, I am very correct. And if I see anything that I feel which is remotely um, not on the ball, or something is happening to me which is totally unacceptable, or to my children, I will fight tooth and nail. For me personally, in my private life, I'm quite um, a different person. But being in the public eye, in the political sphere, you know how it is. It's, it's, I mean, it's black, it's blue against red and red against blue. And I'm really not that kind of person. So I wasn't welcomed in, in the political. You were weaponized. I was. And I was, it was, um, the, my depression was, I mean, certain people, who I won't mention names, but they know exactly who they are, would actually meet you, Joanna, for example. And they would say, yes, because, you know, um, Nikki actually is bipolar. Like, hello. But did this escalate? As in, as in, as in they were trying to, I actually, I mean, my, my mental health, which is, I don't even consider my, my mental health because I don't consider myself as being mentally ill. I consider myself as being depressed. I, I get so sad that it's, it verges on the, you know, on the, it, 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 it verges onto depression. But it, that's why I say it's it's normalized because there are so many people like me. I mean, whoever I speak to. But was your situation? I mean, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to weaken I'm me just gonna say, and just yeah. get me ejected from the from the. But I'm just going to uh, touch on that because I think for uh, you know I'm going to keep coming back to this to make sure that we we clarify this mm -hmm. that depression. I don't want anyone to say that depression is normal, and the reason I don't want to say depression no. is no, normal, it's not normal, but. The reason I want to say depression is not normal is because if it's normalized, then it would make someone reluctant to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the conversation about depression being normalized. You talked about the fact that you couldn't get out of bed. Yes. And that is incredibly debilitating. Not even not um, even having a shower. But having said that, it was not public knowledge because I spoke about it openly. But, but it but had to that... be, you, it, I was, I was weaponized because they made, they, what happened was that in the public eye, the, the perception was made, um, for me to be, to appear as being a bit mad. With regards to your journey, would you say that today you're in a better position than you were five years ago? Definitely. Are you experiencing more control over depression and what helped you get out of that dark spot because when soon when you talked about the dark place you guys both jumped in and said you Nikki you said you can get out of there you 
hit the table and say you have to really fight it uh, but you but, do. so tell me about your journey how did you get away from that dark place well, actually, it happened only recently. I mean, my last bout of depression was over Christmas time. Because I think the festive period is the time that really triggers it. And um, I wasn't going through a very happy time at the time. And I was... I, can and I remember one day when I was literally feeling myself sinking into my mattress. And I just said, I mean, this is just it. I mean, how the hell am I going to be dicky again? You know, the, the happy, carefree person, you know, just, I mean, not cooking for my kids. I was, you know, going through a separation. I said, my God, you know, this is just all the, this is just, just the limits. With, I have to mention, my kids in the meantime, understanding fully and supporting mm -hmm. me and being so amazing. Um, nothing, you know. And then I just remembered there was just this one glimpse. And I just said, this isn't going to last forever. I mean, I've been in such a bad place. And. When I look back to five years ago, to the worst time of my life, when I thought, I mean, there was no way out, and I did get out of it. Um, when you're in that low place, you don't want somebody to sort of make you feel worthless because you said, mm -hmm. like, get out of your bed. Yeah, but then there's also grateful. the toxic positivity, which yes. totally sucks. Yes. Yeah. You well, don't want to hear it. Talk to me about this, because we've touched on that, but you came back to this toxic positivity I want to look at this I mean we, we're talking about how to climb out of and we've talked about sliding into mm -hmm. and now we're talking about climbing out of and I think it's really important to to use those those descriptions because it, you're not going to take a pill even if you take a medication you are not going to be okay the next day no it is a climb yeah. And and Nikki's talked about her climb out of that situation. Joe talked to me, Joanne talk how did you get out of that situation? Okay. So basically I'd given up on therapy. I kind of just gave up on everything. I'm like, okay, now I have the rest of my life. I'm gonna just live like this, like a shell. Wake up, sleep, watch Netflix, wake up, sleep, blah. Um, so you have very little joy. But come on, we don't deserve that, do we? So um, just by pure coincidence, I came across this trauma coach. I'd never thought about trauma as being a, a trigger for depression, but it's a very hard journey. I mean, you have to go right to the very base, like the very core of you, you know, and it's, it takes a lot of guts and like a lot of truths about yourself. So while you heal, it's terrible. It's, it ne you need a pair of balls to do that. But yeah. it's not impossible. And it's, I'm telling you, if I could give one bit of, of advice about this, there's so much beauty in it, even about depression. There's real beauty in it. And you don't really hear about it much. But when you have lost yourself totally, which is what depression does to you, it strips you out. It makes you feel like you're the worst person in the world. You're just a burden. It's better if you don't exist. Oh. And that's why people commit suicide, because they feel it's better if they don't exist. They believe. Oh, and they it's, it becomes very true. Yeah. You, you wish that like you, you sleep and you don't wake up because everybody else would like, bed, my ah, be she's gone, finally. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure it's not true. It was just me thinking that. Um, what you need to do in that case is, you, I didn't know yes. this, your nervous system is crazy. You're not taking proper decisions. You're acting from a place of madness. And there are ways to heal this blinking nervous system that barely ever gets touched on. The first time I heard about the vagus nerve, I'm like, what? What's this? My beautician told me about it. My So the beautician mentioned the vagus nerve. What is the vagus nerve? Now Google it. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got <laughs> Eleanor. Yeah. Don't worry. Eleanor's nodding away. She's going to come to okay. the vagus okay. nerve. The nervous system, which has been in a per permanent state of fight or flight, and then it goes into freeze. And I was in freeze, and maybe less than freeze, because there's, there are like charts, but everyone can do their research about that. So then there are ways I'm of healing your nervous system, and there are silly ways. And you're like, seriously, I'm going to do this. This trauma coach gave me a toolbox, which I must say I don't do it anymore, but I know that it's there. And I do try to do some of it. One of them is cold water therapy, which you can have a cold shower if you don't want to do that. I hate it, but you can even eat a, a bowl of frozen berries. That helps. Yeah. Or if you're in a restaurant and suddenly, like I used to, get a bout of anxiety, 
go to the bathroom, put your hands in freezing water, cold water, mm. wash your face, take some deep breaths, mm. tell yourself you're fine. And it's really, it's an instant. Mm. It works. I've seen it. Now, the other things are really fun for me. Singing. <laughs> Although when you're depressed, the last you thing you want, want to, to do music, is sing. Yeah. You switch off the music in nothing, your car. Dead. I love music and I used to bloody like switch me, off the like music. Dead. What? There's nothing worse than that. It's, it literally stimulates your brain. Then there are other things like I love this a thing called you can find it on YouTube called the Vu meditation. It sounds crazy. Like I tell everybody who's at home, buy stuff. I'm gonna do the Vu. So basically, you have to sound like a foghorn. But this thing they use on veterans who have been through PTSD, and it helps. So you know what? There's it? help out there which we don't know about. Diet. You need to drink water. You need to stay hydrated because being dehydrated also makes you anxious. Sugar is terribly bad for you. Being away from nature is terribly bad for you. So that explains why when I swim in winter, I feel so happy. You That's the bit of nature we have. Not this winter because I was too busy, but I'm well. If I don't feel well, the sea is my refuge. Wow. The sea, trees. Hug a fucking tree. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, you can say that's fine. Hug a tree. <laughs> I love I love nature, your first green, version of that. <laughs> the green, it's like yeah. we're meant to be around nature. The, the concrete we're surrounded by, the, the pollution, the anger there is on the streets. So you know what's really interesting is we talked about a perfect storm that generates and creates depression. Nikki's experience is incredibly valid to her and it's personal to her. She had influencing factors that I don't think any of us can it can have ever experienced and God probably forbid. will and God forbid. And in Joe's case Joanna, you just happened to mention past trauma, almost as of a passing comment. And I think that's incredibly important that we also come back to talk about that in the future. Because I'll, I'll come again if you like. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'll get some more wine for, for all three of you and we'll have this conversation again. But the, there's a perfect storm that is unique to each individual that creates the right components and ingredients to mean that one person has depression. As you said yourself, identical twins could go through very similar experiences. One is affected by depression and the other isn't. But what's really interesting listening to you guys is that your way out of depression is as unique as your slide into depression. Jeez. And so I, because we've talked about medication. So the alien. We've She's talked saying. about one and the other, and we've talked about your therapy tra trauma. So I think it's really important to address this. And I'm going to hand over to you, Elinda, to come back to us yeah. as an expert addressing that. Yes. That, that each person's experience is, is, is individual, but what you recommend, anybody who's listening or watching, what their starting point and what their journey might be. I think if they're listening to this podcast, I think that's already a good starting point. Um, and I absolutely adore the way that you spoke about your journey, your, your whole journey, but also... You feel silly doing it, your huh? Your climb. You do it. But it works. Yeah, it does work. And it works so uniquely. I forgot to mention exercise. Yes. So there's actually that's studies... Terrible. Um, studies that show that 30 minutes of exercise every day um, does have a significant effect on um, on levels of depression. So 
there are so many things out there and it's about finding the right person and the right techniques for you. So if there is a, a therapist who is more into embodiment, into more into vagus nerve, uh, into the vagus nerve. and For me and Nikki, what is this vagus I nerve? No idea, um, like I'm not an expert in it, so I'm not going to be the person to explain it, but it's a way of um, using the limbic system and the... Whoa, what? A uh, limbic system? system. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. You can so, look it up. It's so, fine. But I've heard this. Is this a, can I Never just check? Is this a life. recent thing? I've seen it an awful lot on social no. media. People talking about limbic systems. So for example, yoga, system. yoga is um, as ancient as time. And it is something that is proven to support you to go through depression okay. and to cancer treatments and to so many other um, illnesses and conditions in a way that it helps to support your mind and body connection. So exercise, I know for you, Trudy, it's running that is so mm. supportive for you. And that's therapeutic in itself because your body gets moving, it gets going. And for other people, because of a million different reasons, running might not be for them. So it's not a one size fits all. So finding that person who speaks your language, who taps into your experience and what works for you so for you like you were saying that really spoke true to you um and that worked and somebody might have a freezing cold shower and say what was joanna saying but you can do but the other thing it's it's about trying it and even with these tasks as we said for medication it's also about these therapeutic tasks of these um trial and error what works for you and what doesn't so the cold shower using cold presses even just at the back of your neck just the tapping is tapping um, I heard about that. they might work for someone who is um more inclined to it like joanna but maybe someone who is more um like me forget it yeah, so maybe so, like nikki, for or? someone like nikki maybe cognitive behavioral therapy which is more structured um would speak more to your language and so it's about finding what works for you so even before going to a therapist understanding who they are um seeing a little bit about their background and if they resonate with you when you meet a professional you're both seeing do we work well together can i help you yeah there's actual chemistry of course so if we had to meet and we clicked great so we will work on what the goals are and we'll build on it but if we were to meet and it didn't click maybe i would then offer to recommend a, a colleague who I can see working yes. with you beautifully. And if I can echo what both of these ladies have said through their own experiences and what you're saying now, if you're in depression, you're going through the worst time of your life. And having a connection with someone that you believe in mm -hmm. that is going to assist you, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a psychiatrist, whether it's a psychologist, yeah. that connection is incredibly important. It is vitally important. And I think it's worth saying that for anybody, we go back to this thing about shame. If you don't connect, there's no shame in that. Exactly. It's like going on a first date. You don't always make it. You don't want to make it. I wasn't meaning. Wasn't mean to point at you, Nikki. But if you're going on a first date, you're not necessarily going to have that chemistry with that person. You're human, you know, Trudy. You need to have a light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, that's and the worst part when you think you don't. And I think it always if, is. If, there always is. If I can also add, it is about working to find your protective factors as well. What do you already have within you? that is going to help you through this, which you cannot see. And that is why the support system, whether it's a therapist, a friend, whoever it might be, it's so important to find that connection and to get support, to get out um, of bed, to get into nature. And everything that you mentioned is all statistically proven to support general well-being and mental health um, in general, like Nikki was saying, which is different to being clinically depressed, but they do help with clinical depression to get that they momentum and going free. and they're free. So it is beautiful, but we do need to support the person to identify what they have going for them and to support that um, encouragement and finding, like you said, that sense of self mm -hmm. again, who am I? What do I like doing? What do I enjoy doing? And engaging that again until the brain remembers, ah, we're going to come to some closing thoughts and I'm going to ask each of you ladies to finish our time at this table with something that is 
inspiring and that's going to help motivate somebody who's listening or watching this to, to move forward and to learn from your experiences. Because if, I mean, just as you have done, Nikki, you've spoken out about this and that empowers other people to understand that, that talking about it is, is normal. So I'm going to come around the table, starting with you, Joe. I asked you a minute ago, you said I already thought my, my closing mm. thought is. That's why I'm coming to you first. Okay. So how would you summarize? What is your closing thought for this edition of this? Because okay. I'm pretty sure we're going to be here again. So we said that depression makes you lose everything, right? So you have an idea of what you were like before and you lose that person and you mourn that person because when you're nowhere and you wake up and she's not there, I'm like, please, before I said I'm going to comment about bubbly, I hated being called bubbly because I felt it was like some like fluffy little thing floating around the air. Now, You're when amazing. someone calls me bubbly, I'm like, yes, come back, my bubbly, I love you. And that's because you, you miss who you were. You realize what you were. You say, oh my God, that woman, she was amazing. You hadn't realized it before, but now you know. So depression, when you kind of pause and lose who you were and she comes back, oh my God, it's like the prodigal son, but like, ah, about you. And that's brilliant. That's a brilliant feeling. And you'll never forget it. And that's possible. And it's I've, obviously... I've experienced it myself. Eleanor, your closing thoughts, your, your big beaming, smiling face there. Give us some positivity yeah. for anyone watching or listening. I think hearing Joe, I think the being able to hold your inner child is such difficult work, like you're mm, saying, it and is. it takes so much. Um, I know that's my closing statement, continuing a, a little bit from what from what you, um, Joe beautifully expressed. Um, my closing statement would be, you are not alone. Have this conversation. And it is so important to be kind to yourself, to be compassionate and to reach out. There's so much support, no matter what you're going through, whether it's menopause, whether it's postpartum, whether you are pregnant, even though you've wanted this pregnancy for so long and find yourself feeling depressed, it doesn't make sense. And that's the point. It doesn't make sense. So reach out so that you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and bring in your support system and allow them to help you get out of it mm -hmm. if they are encouraging, because that is such an, a positive, protective um, coping strategy as well. And Maybe something about coping strategies is how important it is to find what works for you. That is a positive and healthy coping strategy that you can maintain and that is sustainable. I don't go back and I say, where is Nikki? Um, who sort of like graduated 25 years ago. Or where is Nikki, the 10 year old, you know, bubbly person and tomboy. No, every time, every episode, Nikki develops into a better person. It's like, you know, like um, a caterpillar develops into a butterfly. And I'm, I'm, hardly, I'm hardly a butterfly. <laughs> but um, um, every time you just get, you, you better yourself. The, I mean, the deeper the, the hit, I mean, the harder you fall, you know, you, you, you surface. You're like a phoenix. You rise from the ashes. I think it's true. And you, um, however, I really, really think that is so important that unless you feel, I mean, there's such a difference between being sad and being depressed. So when you have that little thing that you, you, you literally can't control it and you just feel so um, lethargic that you can't continue with your daily chores. I mean, I really admire you because I was not capable and I'm not capable of doing a, a load, let alone feeding my children when I'm feeling really sad. And thank God my children, I mean, I mean, I can't thank God enough for having had them. I mean, they drive me insane, but they are my saving grace. Having said that, whenever you feel that that real terrible feeling, if you're not capable and forget being demeaning and telling that person that they have to be grateful for what they have, because you think they're not grateful, you think they're not feeling bad and they don't want to get out of bed and do and continue with their daily chores. You think they don't want to go and hug their children. You think that they want to snap at their children because their children are coming in when they're having a sobbing moment and they want to just be in a blacked out room. No, we don't want that. But every time that happens, if you are feeling so bad, like medication didn't work for me and continues not to work for me, 
I think that if you are feeling so bad, it's imperative that you seek medical help because otherwise, if you are in such a bad place, it can only get worse because most people are so ignorant on the subject and it's such a taboo that most of many a time, if you are not, if you don't have, like I had my children, I God knows where I'd have been because every time it was like, Nick, you know, you're this and you're that. And yes, I have so many things to be grateful for. But at that moment, you don't care. No. That's it. You don't care. That is absolutely yeah. it. And I just want to finish up by saying the both of you ladies, and, and Ellen has said it herself, and I'm going to say it as well from personal experience, I think it's worth reiterating that there is no place that is too dark that you cannot come back from. There is no place that is so far away that you cannot come back from. Just as Joe said, there's going to be some work. Just as you said, you have to find the right formula for you. But there is no place too far, too dark and too desperate that you cannot come back from. And I want to say also we'll give all of the details for anybody who needs to get assistance. It's going to be under here if you're watching YouTube. It's going to be on our social media channels. It's going to be on the on the comments underneath the Spotify. But right now I want to say, ladies, thank you for sharing your journey. I'm done with my wine. We have, we've <laughs> annihilated a bo- this beautiful bottle of Primitivo. We chose Amazing. The, you chose a Primitivo and it's all gone. But chin chin. Yes. Thank you so much. Cheers. Keep doing what you're doing, ladies. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.